Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, my job here today is to welcome you to today's webinar, which is entitled Positive Links Using Warm Technology to Re Achieve Retention and Care. I am Melissa Werner, Senior Program Manager at Age United, and I will be serving as your moderator today. I'd like to start us off with a couple of housekeeping whoops, excuse me, technical difficulties. A couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, you've all been placed in listen-only mode with your phones li phone lines muted. Um, you can use the Q&A feature to communicate with the group during the webinar, and we will be using it later in the webinar to ask questions of our fabulous presenters. Anyone experiencing technical difficulties can email Sarah Hashmall at the email address on the screen. And I wanted to let you all know that a recording of this webinar will be available on our website in the very near future, likely later today or tomorrow, and we will email you when it is posted. For those of you who are not familiar with AIDS United, our mission is to end the AIDS epidemic in the United States through strategic planning, capacity building, policy, technical assistance, and formative research. And the goal of today's webinar is to provide an overview of a really wonderful downloadable smartphone application that you may want to consider using to engage clients living with HIV in care and to help them stay engaged in care. As far as our learning objectives go today, we hope that by the end of this webinar, oops, excuse me. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I just received a note to say specifically that this meeting is being recorded um, so that you're all aware of that. And of course, I said that the recording will be available. Okay, we hope that by the end of the webinar, you will be able to um, explain how the use of a smartphone application can be um, used to en enhance your retention and care efforts for people living with HIV that you'll be able to list three factors that you might want to consider in planning such a program and describe how you might use warm technology as our presenters will describe it to you in your work setting. In terms of our agenda, I will provide a very quick and dirty overview of Age United's retention in care program of which the UVA program is part or has been part then we will hear an overview of the Positive Links program. We will then hear from a Positive Links client and hear about her experience. And then, um, as I mentioned, we will have hopefully about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So what is this Retention and Care initiative? It was a three-year initiative focused on retaining people living with HIV and care, funded by MAC AIDS Fund. Through this three-year initiative, um, Grantees provided care to 603 people living with HIV, and um, we with Mac AIDS Fund granted almost $3 million to the field, and we're in the process now of sharing some of the lessons learned and best practices. Um, in terms of innovative approaches, you're going to be hearing about one today. Some of the others were using navigation and support from peers, employing a housing first model, uh, focusing on trauma-informed care, and of course, our fourth little bullet here is use of smartphones to support retention and care. Rick, uh, as well, focused on underserved populations, including transgender men and women, women, children, and their families, and homeless individuals. Here are our seven retention and care grantees. Let's give you a minute to take a look at them. And you can see that the University of Virginia is third on our list, and their fabulous work is going to be highlighted today. We will be hearing first from Dr. Rebecca Dillingham, who is the director of the University of Virginia Center for Global Health. Dr. Dillingham, who is also known to most people, I believe, as Becca, holds faculty positions in the Division of Infectious Disease and International Health and in Public Health Sciences. And, um, Following Dr. Dillingham, we'll hear from Kim Williams, who is a client in the Positive Links program. 
Kim also writes poetry, has performed at open mic nights and other venues. She likes to crochet and scrapbook, loves movies, plays, and books, loves being a grandmother, and is hoping to continue her education to become a social worker. And I just want to say from my interactions with her, in my humble opinion, is a very lovely person. So with that, I will let you take it away, Becca and Kim. Great. Thanks so much, Melissa. And thanks also to Sarah for all your support in developing this uh, webinar. We are extremely honored to have the opportunity to talk a bit about this adventure that we've had, thanks to AG United and the Mac Aids Fund, in developing a program that employs an app, Positive Links, uh, to support uh, retention and care. And, and it has definitely been a team effort. And in that first slide, you can see that long list, which even needs more updating recently. Mm -hmm. And of course, does not list by name, uh, but without whom we would be nothing. All of our incredible participants and clients who have given so much of their own time uh, to create the app and make it what it is today. And I'll continue to highlight that um, throughout uh, the presentation. So in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, we serve a population uh, th who lives in 52 counties, the vast majority of whom are rural. And so as we thought about what we wanted to do to improve retention and care, we considered what the particular challenges are uh, in rural Virginia. And as you'll see on the slide, I put rural in parentheses because many of these challenges are not only rural challenges, they also can be in urban or suburban centers. Um, but just to give you our context, we definitely were thinking about uh, rural areas where, unfortunately, housing, as is uh, alluded to in the picture, is an issue, as are many other uh, challenges to living well with HIV. So certainly stigma, poor access to transportation, uh, poverty, isolation, and behavioral health challenges. In thinking about all of these challenges, particularly those facing those who are located some distance from our clinic and uh, for whom a bus ticket is really not going to overcome all of those challenges, we started to think about how mobile technology or mHealth could facilitate interventions that could possibly address one or even more of those challenges to living well with HIV, importantly, when and where clients want and need it. So not necessarily only in the clinic setting or only in a CBO setting, uh, but also back home in small towns in Virginia or even in parts of the city that might be difficult uh, to access on the bus system, for example. So um, thinking about mobile technology, SMS or messaging, uh, text messaging has been studied pretty extensively to promote adherence to antiretroviral therapy. Uh, many of the studies have been pretty small and short, but have been found to be very acceptable and feasible and have shown promising effects. They were mostly focused on adhering to medication, so taking your medication on time, uh, but an important observation that I have seen uh, in many different settings is that this messaging was perceived by those who received the messages as someone cares. Yes. And that really struck us uh, because we uh, were initially thinking of this as a simple reminder, but we all of a sudden began to consider what, how warm technology might be able to be. So I'm not sure what just happened. Um, I hope that everyone can still see those slides. My view changed a little bit. But as we thought about whether and how to bring this warm technology to our clients, um, we considered texting, which you'll see on the right side of your slide. Uh, but we were also thinking about developing an app. When we thought about texting, we did certainly acknowledge and know uh, that it is better studied. Um, the phones are somewhat cheaper, and in some contexts are more um, 
more common um, amongst our clients. It's also harder to crack the phone screens when they're dropped, and uh, we can tell you all kinds of sad stories about cracked screens. But in the end, we ended up going with an app, uh, which, uh, with developing an app. And I've listed some of the reasons there. I think one, importantly for our clients and also for our organizations, is that an app can be structured to be much more secure uh, than text messaging. In addition, we can send more messages without added cost. Uh, we really felt after we recognized that um, the messages were being perceived as care that we wanted to send more of them. But if people were getting charged for each one, that was less appealing. Many of our clients wanted um, an app structure uh, rather than texting, so that's uh, the consumer demand. And a lot of that is driven by that possibility of, of delivering uh, information, education, um, interaction in different kinds of views, um, also with videos and even chat-like functions. Finally, um, we felt that an app, and specifically an app on a smartphone, um, had the option of facilitating um, addressing other barriers. So I'm not going to say much more about this in uh, this presentation, but uh, to those who are considering maybe a program like this in your setting, I really believe, particularly in, in areas that serve uh, rural populations, that having access to a smartphone with the Internet can be a tremendously important medical intervention to help people live better with any chronic disease, but specifically with HIV. Just as a small example, I'll mention later how many of our clients are struggling with housing insecurity. but. If you can imagine someone who is struggling with maintaining um, uh, an adequate housing, having the opportunity to actually do housing applications, for example, on the Internet, on your phone, um, is a huge advantage. So again, I won't say more about that, but I, I would um, underline uh, for those of you considering um, an app-based program and considering whether or not your clients have access to a smartphone, that it may be worth investing in a smartphone with a data plan uh, for your clients. So we partner with uh, a wonderful uh, technology partner, George Reynolds at Health Decision Technologies, and with our team of researchers and importantly also our clients, uh, we worked with George um, uh, using several uh, app development strategies, which are listed here. So user-based design, self-monitoring, and shrinking the distance, both the physical and the psychological distance. So as I go through um, the a presentation that shows you the features of the app, uh, which is this tool to support engagement in care, I'll be referencing um, how these strategies um, were used. So first of all, user-based design. And I've mentioned a couple of times already how important our participants have been. Uh, these participants um, are individuals who receive care uh, in the Ryan White Clinic at the University of Virginia. Uh, they were recruited because they were new to care or because they were struggling uh, with retention in care or with achieving viral suppression. Uh, they joined the team uh, to test out the app um, and also to give us feedback and ideas about how to design the app from the very beginning. If you look on the left side of your um, uh, screen with the um, the, and you see the icon that I'm pointing to, um, which is blue with links, the first thing you might notice about that is that it's not red and it doesn't have a ribbon. Our participants from the beginning uh, did not want to have an icon um, that referenced HIV um, in the interest of minimizing risk of disclosure. As you move um, from left to right, you see a login screen. Uh, the, the app uh, requires a password to be entered uh, prior to using it so that a child or a friend or a random person that picks up your phone is not going to be able to get into the app uh, without your password. 
Um, moving again uh, to the left, you can see the opening screen, the um, name of the app at the top. Uh, next bar down shows the different features, which I'll tell you a little bit about. And at the top, we have um, self-monitoring, which I'll come back to. These are questions that come to our participants every day that are relevant to the way they care for themselves. Um, and below that, uh, we have a community message board post, which I'll also uh, talk about a bit later. So one of the things that we knew from our participants was as already mentioned, privacy was very important, um, as was the ability to coordinate care in a convenient manner. So these next two screens uh, represent for me two things. First of all, the information about appointments and also about contacts is within the app behind the password. So this is private information. Uh, in our clinic, we often find our clinic handbook in the trash right outside the door uh, because people often are concerned about taking that information home and having it in a place where it might be discovered. So having clinic information that is critical to coordinating care in a password-protected safe app has been very important to our clients. In addition, you'll note on the left that there's opportunity to uh, reschedule appointments. Uh, I think we all know that sometimes it's not between 8 and 5 that you remember that you need to change your appointment. And so having the opportunity to reschedule an appointment or contact a, pro a provider um, at 2 in the morning if that's what you need uh, has been a really important part of uh, this app's features and was, was uh, emphasized uh, early on by our participants' needs. Um, this next slide just reemphasizes the opportunity to connect with care better. Um, this is a messaging feature that is uh, available for participants to message with providers who have opted in so they can message with their case manager, with their psychologist, uh, with their medical provider uh, at a time that is convenient for them and in a place that has the level of privacy that feels uh, good to them. Um, so, self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is a behavior that um, has been demonstrated over and over again to be very important uh, for living well with chronic disease. So what is an example? Measuring blood sugar if you're living with diabetes, measuring your peak flow if you're living with asthma, and monitoring your adherence uh, if you are living with HIV. We know that taking medicine daily, uh, at least today in 2016, is, one of, is the most important thing that you can do to suppress your virus. Uh, so encouraging people to keep track of that uh, is an important way uh, to live better with HIV, at least in terms of viral suppression. So each day uh, the app pushes out um, a question, uh, did you take your medications today? Um, and invites the participant to answer. That question serves as a reminder um, and also as a way to track uh, whether or not uh, medications have been taken on a regular basis. Of course, we all know that medication isn't the only thing um, that leads to living well with HIV. There are a lot of factors that may make you more or less able um, to take your medications and in addition um, that make you more or less able to enjoy your life. So in our context, uh, stress level was something that our participants um, uh, needed to monitor to be able to try to live better with HIV. So you'll see on, up on the right that people are able to monitor their stress level. And self-monitoring, I would say, is okay if you just monitor it, notice it for a moment, and then move on. But it's even better if you can monitor it and then do something about it. One aspect of our app that we're really excited about is that we try to make our data entered actionable. So if you are having high stress and you start to notice that you have high stress, well, within the app, we actually have tools 
uh, thanks in part to a collaboration with the Holistic Life Foundation from Baltimore, uh, to help people learn strategies uh, to reduce their stress and hopefully to live better overall and with their HIV. Um, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, so I was speaking of actionable data on the last uh, slide. If you want it to be actionable, you need to be able to see it. So the app also has a dashboard feature which allows people to uh, take a look back at how their mood has been, how their um, stress level has been, and how, um, how their adherence to their medication has been. This can be viewed in this pill form or also in a calendar, depending on what you prefer. In addition, the app pushes out a weekly summary uh, to let people know uh, how they've done um, that week overall, even if they haven't had a chance to look back at their dashboard. In addition, um, in order to encourage people um, to engage with the app and particularly with self-monitoring, uh, we've been able to add some features that make it just a little bit more fun. So one is being able to choose uh, your own avatar or emoji to represent yourself on the community message board, which I'll show you in just a moment. We've also added badges. And importantly, uh, thanks to uh, some additional support from the Virginia Department of Health, uh, we've been able to work to integrate a CD4 and viral load um, values as a feature that can be monitored uh, by our participants in the app. So another aspect that we've um, been able to enhance uh, with assistance from the Virginia Department of Health is related to shrinking that distance. So, um, I mentioned that as our third uh, strategy for app design. And what I'm showing you here uh, is, is a screenshot of our administrative dashboard. So how is that shrinking the distance? You may remember that I said we serve 52 counties um, and uh, folks are often quite far away. And so finding ways to help our providers, whether they're medical providers or uh, case managers to stay in better touch uh, has been a really um, important uh, issue for us. So with this administrative dashboard, we're able now to share information reported by our participants uh, with providers uh, at a time that is convenient for them. They're able to respond to messages, they're able to see either um, an overall view as seen here um, or an individual view to check out how is the patient doing, how, how is um, the patient's mood, what is the stress level, and how is adherence, um, how has their adherence been going. And this has allowed uh, our providers to be able to react uh, in a more timely fashion. Because in the past, whether it was a case manager or a social worker or a psychologist, if we're just seeing individuals every three months, and at about a month and a half, there was a major crisis that caused a lot of stress um, and resulted in uh, poor adherence. When we hear about it, it may be too late uh, to do much about it. So we're hoping that with this kind of feedback, this kind of actionable data available to uh, providers, that they can also partner better with our clients uh, to overcome um, barriers to adherence and to engagement. So these are just a couple of quotes from our pilot work with our providers talking about uh, the ways in which having access to this information through the administrative website has been helpful to them. Uh, one of our pharmacists, who not surprisingly uh, works with a lot of patients who have trouble with medication adherence, uh, notes that this has allowed her to gauge where the participants are personally in their action plan and to address specific barriers and concerns. Um, another uh, provider notes that this is a way to coordinate care better uh, because everyone has the same information about issues that may or may not be medical, uh, but which are potentially affecting our clients' ability to live well uh, with HIV. So um, 
we can't say it enough. I think I don't think I've ever met a provider in a Ryan White clinic that doesn't say that transportation is sometimes a, a problem. Um, this is uh, the distance that our participants travel, and as you'll remember, we're trying to shrink that distance with that dashboard that I was showing you, um, the dashboard for the providers. Um, but another way that we're trying to shrink the distance is uh, by shrinking the psychological distance by allowing for conversations to occur outside of a clinic in a support group-like setting, although it has a couple of important features. The support group is online and available at any time. It also is anonymous. So we call this our community message board. Um, and the first slide just shows a message that was sent from our Positive Links team. So for those who are involved in clinic administration and management, it is nice to have a place where you can post general messages. For example, we're in ACA enrollment um, right now about reminding people of the importance of ACA enrollment. But in addition, and I think more importantly, this community message board is a space for what our participants call the Positive Links family. Mm -hmm. um, this is a space where the only rule is that you cannot allow um, your identity to be revealed. So you choose uh, your own handle um, and you post about what's important to you, about questions that um, are on your mind and that you would like the views of other people living with HIV. The Positive Links team posts occasionally, but uh, actually rather rarely compared to the Positive Links family uh, who has really created um, uh, an, their own community of support uh, in a safe, in this case, anonymous space. And I think that that quote uh, listed there says a lot about why that's important. Um, who uses the community message board? We've done an analysis of the first eight months, um, which is actually about a year and a half old now. I, this data has not changed, but the formal analysis that we did was early on in the project, and we were very interested to learn that the community message board um, was used most frequently by those who were non-white, mostly African American, those without private insurance, which was a marker for um, lower uh, economic um, uh, attainment, and finally by those who uh, had an unsuppressed viral load. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it wasn't all the people who were already doing great. Um, it was people who were maybe historically um, less likely statistically to be doing well, and also those who'd showed us that their viral loads were not suppressed. Um, and so the fact that they were using it was really exciting to us because we had uh, all worked together to design something that was meaningful for the people who needed it most. Um, to give you a little bit better sense of this first cohort, and also to let you know a little bit about some of the outcomes that we've documented associated with use of this app-supported program for retention and care, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the first cohort um, whom we began to recruit in September uh, 2014 um, through May 2016. That first cohort um, consisted of 75 people. Um, you'll note uh, that about three quarters of those had incomes that fell below 100% of the federal poverty line. Almost half were unemployed and about a quarter uh, were um, unstably housed. The, in addition, you'll note that uh, transportation and food insecurity were major issues for many of our participants. Importantly, um, using the app uh, seemed to help people engage better in care. That was our main goal. And I've just put up a chart. I'm going to put the explanation up here, and I want you to look particularly at the pink line. So on the y-axis um, is the HAB1 engagement marker. So for those who aren't familiar with that, that's a federally mandated engagement um, in care uh, benchmark 
that all of us report when we're delivering uh, HIV care. On the x-axis, we have time, so baseline, six months, and 12 months. These different lines represent different quartiles of use of the app. So what does that mean? So for example, this pink line is the top quartile. So you may be able to see down here that in um, the first year of the project, that the people in that pink line viewed the app 500 or more times. So that was the top quartile, the top 25%. And interestingly, similar to what I reported on the slide about who used the community message board, um, in terms of the people who use the community message board at baseline being more likely to be virally unsuppressed, at baseline, those who ended up using the app the most were the least likely to have met their benchmark for engagement and care. You can see here only about 25%. By six months, 100% of those individuals were meeting their benchmark, and even out at 12 months, um, that group had gone from the least likely to meet their benchmarks to the most likely, which was something that was really exciting to us. Again, that with this collaborative process, at least in our context, we had created a program that served those who needed um, the most help. In addition to engagement in care, we also saw strong um, increases in CD4 count and reductions in viral load, increases in percent of those who are virally suppressed. So as we know, um, it's of course not the only aspect of living well with HIV, but a higher CD4 count and a lower viral load um, uh, prevent opportunistic infections and allow individuals to live healthier lives. In addition, um, from a public health perspective, uh, we're um, always looking to decrease community viral load to decrease the risk of passing the infection. So in conclusion, I'm just going to give you our uh, recipe for warm technology. Um, first of all, the design strategies I think are important. Security, both for your organization and for individuals, is tremendously important. We used evidence-based um, interventions, and we, we built our intervention from evidence-based practices uh, to support living well with a chronic disease. Our users were invo involved uh, throughout the process. I didn't mention this before, but we did anticipate low literacy. The average reading level of our participants in Positive Links is a fourth grade reading level. And we've had rigorous evaluation throughout um, in, in, with thanks to Johns Hopkins University also early on in the AIDS United program. Uh, for uh, assisting with that evaluation. In addition, um, I've talked about the features of our warm technology. And I put up Bank of America, Fitbit, and Facebook because I don't think that these are necessarily new ideas, but I think they are very important, particularly when targeted towards living well with HIV. So coordination of care. Again, uh, I put the Bank of America app up there because this app allows people to coordinate the care when and where it is most convenient for them. Self-monitoring, Fitbit, and all the other exercise monitors out there, this is an uh, evidence-based um, intervention for achieving health-related goals. And finally, social support. I put Facebook up there, but it's important to note that uh, achieving and accessing social support is also a really critical component um, in managing uh, chronic disease well. So decreasing the stigma, shrinking that psychological distance, allowing people to meet in a safe space is another critical aspect of um, living well, period, um, and living well with HIV. So overall, warm technology, we believe, builds client skills for engagement. So it is not simply a reminder. It allows people to grow and learn uh, to manage their own care. Uh, it facilitates health, and health promotion and care um, by enhancing connections between clients and the care community, building trust uh, where the trust may have been eroded for a variety of reasons. It can be adapted uh, to serve diverse populations 
and we believe it provides a cost-effective option to promote engagement and retention in care. Um, we are currently integrating our um, app with our electronic medical record at UVA, continuing rigorous evaluation and um, identifying partners for adaptation and implementation of the program at additional sites. I'm going to end before I pass this over to Kim uh, with what I think uh, is uh, the best articulation by one of our participants of uh, why this really matters. We're delighted that engagement in care has improved. We're uh, very pleased that viral suppression has been achieved by more of our participants. Uh, but I think that what really makes a difference to us and what makes a difference to our participants is their um, opportunity using this app to build and participate in a positive community. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and look forward to your questions later. Hello, everyone. And my name is Kim Williams. <coughs> And uh, I am a participant of the uh, Positive Links phone app. Uh, one other th aspect I wanted to add uh, about this app is not only do you need a password to log in, if you have logged in and something happens, your doorbell rings and you lay it down, uh, within three to five seconds, that app, you have to re-log in. You, you cannot access it. If you do not uh, start writing or engaging within a certain amount of time, you have to re-log back in. So it, it, there is a, a built-in privacy factor also in that. Uh, and I love that because I have set this phone down a number of times in a public setting and in that built-in feature has kept my anonymity when I forgot to. <laughs> so uh, the thing I want to, to say is uh, I love this app. Had I had this app, when I was newly diagnosed, I believe wholeheartedly that I would not have struggled as much. It would not have taken me so long to uh, be adherent to my meds and to, uh, I would have had a better social life. Uh, the other aspect about this app uh, that helps me, the, the three questions that are asked daily, uh, the, how is my stress level, and how is my mood, and have I taken my meds? Uh, of course, they have helped with my adherence because it is a reminder, but it has also given me a way to monitor my stress level and my moods. This I couple with journaling, and if I notice that I've been stressed for maybe a, a little under a week or close to a week, at my next therapist appointment, we begin to discuss uh, what that stress is about and how long I've had, had the stress and what are the reasons uh, for that stress. That has helped me tremendously. Uh, and as far as my uh, moods are concerned, it's also helped me to realize that I may need to change some medications uh, as far as my uh, antidepressant because it's not doing what it used to do. So just by uh, me keeping, a, I say, a running record and being able to reflect back on that at my convenience helps in every area of my health care. Um, the other tremendous thing I, I like about this app is that I can be in constant contact with my whole team. My, my providers from my gynecologist to my therapist 
down to my medical case manager, uh, my nutritionist. I can be in constant contact with them. Uh, I can get a, I can get in contact with them, and I can get a timely response. Um, I also would like to say that the PL study team, uh, they respond in a timely manner. Uh, we get also uh, quizzes. We're not actually required to do the quizzes, but we can. And uh, this helps keep us current in the, the latest technology in HIV and AIDS. It's always associated with a link where you can conduct your own research and find out what's going on in the AIDS and HIV community, medical-wise, and uh, it helps initiate or gives you uh, the foundation to have a conversation with your, your primary care provider or uh, anyone on your team. Uh, I especially love that. I, I love to learn new things, and I love to know what's going on. And the best things that I can do uh, to help me stay in care and to be the healthiest that I can possibly be. Um, so, and the aspect that I did want to touch on also is that someone cares. It is very important to know that someone cares. Uh, although we are anonymous and we all have avatars, if one of or two or more of us realize that one of our uh, family members has not posted, we send roll call and shout out. Hey, we're missing you. How are you? What's going on? Holla back at your girl, you know. Uh, we, we, we are involved that much that we notice when someone has not logged in uh, and we want to hear from them and to find out that they're all right. And, uh, and that is, cannot be interpreted any other way but for caring. Uh, it's not that they want to be in your business. Uh, the anonymity factor is there, so you feel safe. I have gotten uh, or I have received a lot of uh, help for, for uh, just, I'll give an example. I had an experience with microaggression. I did not know whether I was just being super sensitive that day or did this person really just give me this experience with microaggression. And so I put it and posted it to my PL family. And I got responses back almost immediately that let me know that, yes, what you thought that was, that's what it is. And when this has happened to me, this is what I did. And this the solutions are, are just pouring in. It's not that you just state a problem and it lingers. You get solutions or different strategies to implement whatever it is that you're trying to implement or to answer whatever question you have posted. You get a variety of from different perspectives, from different some are spiritual, some are not, some are just logical, and you, I mean, you are, your success rate goes up tremendously with things of that nature. Um, so that's what it's meant to me, and that's what I utilize it for. Uh, it's very user-friendly. It's very easy to use. Uh, I'm not a guru by any means, uh, so if I can use it, <laughs> anyone can use it. It's very user-friendly. Um, also with this living with HIV and or AIDS, there has to be a certain amount of 
transparency and I would say honesty so that you feel free enough to really speak about what's going on with you. And because of this anonymity factor, it, it has given you that you don't have to worry about saying anything and someone associating it with your face. That removes that and so you're more free to be more transparent and to talk about what's really going on with you and your honesty level with your, your team, your providers, and they can actually help you. So that um, is what I have to say about the app. Uh, I am definitely a fan and I would, uh, I would encourage anyone uh, who is newly diagnosed, has been diagnosed. I've been diagnosed for 16 years, and I benefit from it just as much as someone who has been newly diagnosed. So, and that is what I wanted to share. Well, Kim, thank you so much to um, Becca for providing your perspective on program planning, development, implementation, and evaluation, and to Kim for sharing how this program, um, Positive Links, and this app has helped you. It sounds like it really has had a very positive impact in your life. And I would like to uh, go ahead and take some questions. We've got quite a bit of time for questions, which is excellent. Anyone who has questions, please feel free to go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. If they're for someone in particular, please make a note of that. And if they're just general, we, I will reread them and open them up to see which of our wonderful presenters would like to address them. While people are getting their questions together, this is Becca again. I did want to indicate one thing about the app. Um, we, as I, you may have heard me say, consider this to be an app-supported retention and care program. So we imagine that this program will be deployed from a care environment, whether that's a community-based organization or a clinic, um, and that being deployed from a care environment, meaning that you can't just download this app of the App Store. Rather, a care environment, again, whether it's a CBO or a clinic, would decide that they wanted to incorporate this tool into their overall program for retention and care. And then they would provide the code for the app. Um, I think that having these private communities is another aspect of security and safety. Um, there are not going to be people that are trying to enter the Positive Links family um, who uh, have not uh, accessed it through, through, through a care environment um, and who we would expect um, are going to enter that uh, environment with the same goodwill um, that the other participants bring to it. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, it looks like we've got some questions pouring in. The first is from Alicia Downs. Who comprises the PL team? So we have an incredible coordinator, Avalena Waldman, um, and she is uh, the full-time coordinator of enrolling people in the um, uh, project um, and troubleshooting if there are questions. Um, and also doing on, ongoing monitoring and evaluation. Um, in addition, uh, we have a, our developer whom I mentioned, George Reynolds, who uh, supports uh, the app and is incredibly responsive about iterating the app in response to our participants' feedback um, and also uh, staff feedback. Um, myself and Dr. Karen Ingersoll are the lead scientists um, on the team. Um, and that has been a feature of um, developing the program uh, in terms of uh, implementing the program elsewhere, we would imagine, depending on the number of participants that you wanted to uh, include, that it would be um, about uh, one FTE uh, that might be split um, between different uh, 
roles, like for example, if there was a retention and care coordinator or a medical case manager who was particularly responsible for retention and care. Great, thank you. Another question is from Marjorie Katz. Do you purchase phones or phone for participants? We do. Um, we have been very fortunate with our funders, um, both Age United and Mac AIDS Fund, as well as Virginia Department of Health, that our funders have recognized um, the instrumental and value and the importance of purchasing uh, phones and plans, which also uh, maintains a constant phone number uh, for our participants, making it easier for um, them to reach us and us to reach them. Great, thank you. Um, question from Adeline Escavias, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly and apologize if I'm not. How do we determine if a certain medical provider is using their app to help their patients? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we're working on that right now. Um, thanks to the ability to um, capture data, usage data from the administrative website, we can see the ways in which um, a provider interacts with the website and also interacts electronically um, with a participant. Uh, we are currently doing observations with members of our study team observing um, our client participants and our provider participants interacting in the clinic to try to get a better sense of how uh, providers are actually using the app. So we'll let you know more about that as we learn more. Great. Question from Christine Kabui, and again, I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly. Can you please provide more information on the uptake of this app among the youth, specifically how successful was it? Do you have a breakdown of the youth age groups that use the app? Yeah, so um, in that first 75, um, we had, the average age was in the mid-30s, um, and the percentage of people under 30 was about 20%. Um, so it ended up being a little bit older population than we expected. Um, uptake amongst the youth was l lower than we had hoped um, in the first iteration, in large part we believe because we uh, only allowed people to use the app on phones that we provided. And many of the, and we also originally only designed for Android, and many of our youth um, were using iPhones, um, and they already had their own phones, and they didn't want to carry two phones. Um, uptake has been better now that we've changed so that we still offer to support um, a phone and a plan, but we are putting the app on individuals' own phones. Um, and the uptake amongst youth has been better um, in that case. So uh, that's something else that I'd have to give another update on, but I think that that has overcome some of the youth reluctance. I will say that um, I'm 45 and therefore old, and some of my younger um, uh, patients, are, you know, uh, it's kind of like, Dr. Dillingham, you know, this is so 2014. Um, so it can be hard with the youth to, <laughs> to keep up. Um, uh, but I, I will say that I think that um, ultimately the functionality of the app has been very helpful to people and even to youth. It, it's not a game. Um, but it is very, it is nonetheless very useful um, even to youth. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Danielle Pleasant. Fabulous idea, and while I understand that this app is still in its develop developmental and application stages, do you have plans to make this app available for use by other organizations? And I am trying to scroll down and see the end of the question. Unfortunately, for some reason, it is not showing up. But in any case, if you could answer that first part, that would be helpful. And Danielle, if you'd like to type just the second part, um, retype again so I can see it at the top of the message, that would be great. So the question is, uh, do you have plans to make the app available for use by other organizations? 
We do, um, and uh, in 2017, hope to be um, piloting that with the um, first um, uh, replication site. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm sure we can provide my email, um, and we'd be happy to discuss that. Absolutely. Thanks. Brandon Montanez, or Montanez, is wondering what about the app being hacked? Yeah, so I'm a physician, not a cybersecurity person. Um, so I probably cannot give you uh, the full technical answer. But what I will tell you um, is that our developer um, has undergone uh, multiple security reviews um, by our health system um, and by our university as a whole and has passed all of them with flying colors. Um, I imagine that um, just about anything uh, can be hacked, but I can uh, affirm that um, every precaution has been taken to prevent that um, and that the servers that support the app are HIPAA compliant, um, and that all data that is passed back and forth um, between participants and the server um, is secure and encrypted. Great, thank you. Rebecca Arrington wants to say, thank you, Kim. It's wonderful to hear about using the app. It's one thing to hear about it, but to hear about ac actually using it is great. And followed by a question from Age United from Sarah Hashmal. Kim, can you share how you were introduced to the app? Was it smooth when you started using it? Yes, I, I was introduced to the app um, some months ago, mm -hmm. six, maybe nine months mm -hmm. ago. And uh, I immediately uh, was happy because of the phone. My daughter had been telling me that I had a a dumb phone and I needed a smartphone because I couldn't <laughs> Skype, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't Marco Polo, and, and she would constantly rag me. Uh, due to my role as a peer coach, I it was noticed that I needed a more updated phone system. And so I was introduced to it through that venue uh, initially. And uh, as I said, I'm no computer guru. If I can use it, anyone can use it. And uh, my, I, I am now up to date and current as, as far as uh, the phone is concerned, which makes my daughter very, uh, very happy. Uh, the other thing is, uh, because I am a, a client at the Ryan White Clinic, uh, and I have several team members that I needed to maybe reschedule or juggle appointments or needed appointment reminders. That has that's another aspect that it has helped me tremendously. It gives you appointment reminders on a calendar to your phone. You can never not ever remember an appointment again, which was a tremendous. <laughs> For me. So that's how I was initially introduced to it and I have in turn been trying to get as many people, especially some of my uh, peers that I see in help in the clinic as a peer coach to uh, be participants in this. Um, and it also helps in uh, with the depression and isolation. It attacks that while you're still, you know, using this app, you are, you begin to become more sociable and you are not so isolated, especially for those that are in the rural areas. Um, isolation is a big thing. And then uh, depression and isolation seem to go kind of hand in hand and then everything else kind of spirals down from there. So uh, it breaks all of that. Yeah. I hope I've answered that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I do remember when you and I talked recently, you said that you were a little bit wary at first about chatting on the app or using the community feature. Can you talk for a minute about what it was that helped 
do you feel more comfortable and really start talking with others? The, the avatar and the anonymity factor. Okay. Uh, I, I uh, yeah, I was very concerned about that, as anyone uh, would be uh, the hacking issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, and so once I did have the experience, I, I tried to make sure that it was safe and it is safe. It's very safe. Mm -hmm. I'm very convinced that it is safe. Uh, and so that uh, that was my most fearful uh, thing about someone seeing this that should not. Mm -hmm. Understandably. And it sounds like the, the program really thought through that and um, kind of designed Design the app in a way that would really help people feel comfortable talking yes. and sharing their stories and asking for help. Yes. So folks, I am sorry to say that we are right at 3 o'clock. Um, what I will do is I will export the remaining questions and see if we can get them answered and we can post the questions and answers along with the recorded webinar when we post that because we want to make sure everybody gets the information they're seeking. I would love to thank our very fabulous presenters for sharing their experiences. I believe they are open to um, answer questions and to be contacted. We'll include that contact information along with the Q&A responses. And I would like to thank all of you for participating today and take care. Continue doing the good work you're doing. Take care. Bye.